Kitty, it seems that Kurt is, is not with us. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to be flying solo perhaps. Uh, it should be interesting as I have only seen this, the presentation slides today. <laughs> you have to bear with me a little bit. challenges that life throws at me. And I have actually presented once before where I didn't have, it wasn't my material, but I had had a chance to look at it before. So this is gonna, it's going to be an interesting one. So hopefully um, Kurt will arrive as we go. So I'm going to flick over the ones that are not so meaningful to me. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit today about the project that we're working on, the very exciting project we're working on here at Curtin, which is really focusing on how we could use learning analytics to support uh, area around student retention. So obviously student retention is a massive uh, problem and an issue for us. Um, currently we have something like 54% uh, of students not completing from our local student population. And uh, this is obviously a, a fairly major concern for all universities in Western Australia and, and internationally. One of the reasons around uh, retention and, and why retention can be an issue is because we don't necessarily have the, the dashboards and the systems and the processes in place to really flag up when there are issues and what we can do to support that. So over time we've evolved various data sets which we've been looking at and we've evolved various interventions which we've been looking at but we haven't really joined the two together that well, um, I, I think it's fair to say, across the sector. So what we really wanted to do with this project was to try and join the dots together. Um, so we wanted to look at the information, we wanted to find that data set and we wanted to find a way to actually understand the interventions and whether they were being successful or not and be able to close that loop. So we've talked a lot today about predictive analytics and really this project really moved us towards understanding uh, dynamic analytics. And I think that move from predictive to dynamic analytics really is the kind of background story to, to what we found. So at Curtin we've got a, a fairly kind of um, significant set of KPIs around retention. We want to get to, uh, I think it's 90% by <laughs> 2017 and we've got a lot of pressures around adaptive and personalised learning and how we can actually start to support the student experience and, and make that more, um, more engaging. So a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last few months with Deloitte was really looking at trying to join the dots together, trying to look at how we can bring that student experience in and understand that, that student's journey throughout. And what we've tried to do is to try and understand analytics in a much more complicated and, and um, sophisticated way. And this kind of model really is, is what we've come up with. And it's really looking at analytics, not just as in learning analytics, but looking at breaking it down throughout the whole process of the learning journey. So looking at market analytics at the, at the big front end of the student before they even actually come to Curtin. Looking at learning analytics, so all those support structures that are in place, all those data sets that are in place, how we can actually model that. Looking at curriculum ac uh, analytics as well, so how can we actually support the teaching experience around that? How can we create that adaptive curriculum uh, experience as well? And of course, as part of that, the teaching analytics as well, how we can actually build that experience around the learner and in terms of making them ready for their career, how we can actually start to support the graduate analytics as well. These will probably be really meaningful if Kurt was here. <laughs> but I have absolutely no idea what he was going to say there. We've got one of those. Sorry? We've got one of those. <laughs> it, 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 one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the Rotary and Kurt yeah. channels. Yes. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Put you out as a Maybe he's that's what it's going to be here in 15. He's at Curtin now, he says. So he's yeah. finding his way. Well, maybe he can't find the room in. Okay, but he'll come just in time for my slides. So I think what I'll do is I'll give him my slides to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll get him back. <laughs> he'll pay for this. I was actually kind of. Uh, 
um, signalling this, this would be the Ike and Tina Turner of uh, duos for lectures, and I actually begin to see actually that really was the case, and we'll, we'll see. So what we really wanted to do then, so there is this obviously return on investment, this is something that, that uh, is very important to universities now, we're in a much more global um, uh, comp competitive environment. So how much money can we save from keeping those students on board? Well, $2.4 million can be saved if we can actually keep those 50 students uh, on board. So what did we do? Oh, no, these are the ones I should have saved for him. These are my slides. <laughs> so uh, what we did was we, we stepped back a bit and we actually started to look around breaking down the problem. We came up with this very uh, interesting um, study design structure and we really wanted to combine qualitative and quantitative methods together. So we did a lot of work around building up some hypothesis around what we thought were key issues. And in fact, somebody talked about them earlier, one of them that we did pick up, which was, you know, is there any evidence that public versus private, you know, do public students, are they uh, more likely to be retained? And we actually found that wasn't the case, but these were the kinds of hypotheses that we were generating. From that, we also then developed a student discovery model, and that allowed us to segment all of the students that we used in the study, and the study was a longitudinal one, looking at data from four years of student uh, activity, and that involved 54,000 students, mainly across our, uh, our Curtin um, sites. We then did a certain amount of qualitative study, we talked to students, we talked to staff, we, we created the, an understanding around what those kinds of hypotheses would be so that we would be able to understand that data set and to be able to ask those kinds of questions. And we brought together a lot of data, including Student One, Blackboard data. There were 50 billion rows of data just from Blackboard, using survey data, qualitative data, and external data sets, including SES indexes. And then we brought that data together into an analytical data set, a ADS, bringing those 10 sources together, that was 300 gigabytes of data, 12 billion data elements were used, and as I say, about 50, 51,000 students, 1,273 attributes, and that was in eight clusters. So this was big data, but probably in terms of CERN, still kind of little data, but for higher education sector, this is, this is probably as big as it's gonna get at this point. So this data we pulled together and we created the student discovery model so this led us to highlight particular areas. So for example, we could then begin to pick out an area where it was more likely that those students were at risk. So for example, we found that uh, if the student failed their first two assignments, they were then really in this high risk group. And that high risk group numbered about 5,594 students in total. And the likelihood of those students to graduate, well, 8% of those students were likely to graduate. So obviously the attrition rate there was, was very high. The international uh, entrepreneurs, as we call them here, were at the other end of the spectrum. So they were really l very highly likely to graduate. And in fact, it was 84% possibility of graduation in that group. And these were mainly international students, often from Asian countries of, of origin. Many of them were from CBS, um, and they were in that group. And as you can see, we had other groups as well that we were picking out. So the uh, self-organized map, uh, which we've seen there, which gives us a lot of information, obviously underpinning that, there's a lot of data in, in there. Um, and if you look at these maps, you can begin to see how you can actually pick out the areas where uh, they're more likely to be, um, be dropping out, or the areas here in red where they're more likely to be retained. So what do we find? Now, there's an enormous amount that we found, and I can't even begin to say how much data is in there and how much more there is to find. And I'm calling it a, a paper, paper gold mine at the moment because there's just so much in that data set alone. But just to give you kind of one example of the kinds of hypotheses or concepts that we were looking at, um, we looked at online engagement with Blackboard, and we found that there was um, evidence that higher use of, of Blackboard was equated with higher likelihood of being retained. How did we know this? Well, we looked at the Blackboard usage, we looked at the likelihood of attrition, and we could then see where 
those uh, students actually lay, and then we would, would then know, we would be able to, uh, from that, to be able to say whether the attrition was higher or lower. So what's the hypothesis between that? Online engagement increases retention. That assumption is, is proven from our study. So that is just the tip of the iceberg, as I say. We've actually picked out 54 of those hypotheses and tested them. There's another 205 that we picked out that we haven't tested yet. So you can kind of get an idea of the scale of what we have there and how exciting that is in terms of what we can do. So things that we did look at were previous education, so whether they were private or public school, things like online engagement, which we've looked at, the cohort type, um, and, and so on. Things that we didn't get to are kind of on this end, so looking at assessment and so on. So there's a lot there that we, we need to do. So it's a lot of data, a lot of questions, and, and quite a lot of answers there. Uh, what do we do next? So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to interrogate that data set, of course, and look at ways that we can work with colleagues across the university to test more of those hypotheses and look further more deeply. The other thing that we've been talking about and what we're going to do is to build a learning analytics capability which will allow us to do more of these things and do it more dynamically. And we're actually developing a roadmap and implementation that is allowing us to actually look further forward to do that. So that's very much the kind of headlines, I guess, of the study. Um, there's a lot of depth in there and there's a lot more to be said and a lot more to explore. But I think that that gives quite a good kind of overview, at least, of the, of the project as a whole. So then I'll open it up to you for questions. Thank you. I guess uh, the, the first question to strike me is, when are we going to close the loop for a tutor to say, okay, these students in my group are at risk and I need to intervene? Yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting because uh, as well as this project, which is uh, very much, I suppose, a, a research project in a sense, we already have a, a certain amount of capability in Blackboard Analytics that we also have, which should be able to, and I'm looking over at Gordon, we should be able to offer that functionality to, to tutors actually e even even now. There are some tools that are currently available in Blackboard, but they're not really that rich. They're also not that, um, I think in terms of graphical dashboard, that, sorry, um, that useful to be able to specifically identify problems due to, <coughs> to predict behaviours. Um, we have a project that we're in the embryonic stage of actually implementing, which basically uh, looks at much more um, uh, richer data sets that combine not only uh, behaviour and the, the, the actual activity that's going on in the learning management system, but also combining it with a much more richer data set from the student record system. Um, and um, talking of privacy, that's where we probably a lot of some of our stumbling blocks in terms of pushing out a project, but ultimately we would want to be able to have uh, dashboards um, that not just sit inside the learning management system, but sit outside of them, and that I guess become available to various levels of the organisation in terms of their importance. And when I say importance, some of these actually actually at, at the, the, chalk, the chalkboard of the cold face, which is you know being able to intervene directly within the situation as well as much more high level um, organisational performance um, dashboards for the executive heads of schools, um, business intelligence, a whole variety of um, uh, you know, people. And I think, that, I think the actual um, dream is to be able to take all of those data sets and cluster them together um, and obviously allow them to, to be subscribed to so that you could then create linkages between data sets. So as an example, we might have seen um, an unusual one that we've got that, that's actually been mined or collected, one for parking as an example. Um, people go, well, why would you want to you know, collect parking data? Well, sometimes you probably predict whether something that's actually students physically coming to class, how they perform differently for the ones that specifically are online. Um, and it might even be predicted to say we really need to change our parking apps. <laughs> but um, students probably have an opinion on that already, but um, 
it's it's an ongoing journey. I think we've just started, but I think basically we're at the stage um, sort of saying what um, you know the the NSA uh, type type analogies. We're creating a haystack, and then we're just trying to find all the needles in there. So I think we're on that journey, and hopefully we'll find the magnet that pulls them out. Mm. I mean, this project can, can deliver that, um, but we're building a kind of a deeper capability that's going to underpin all of the Curtin um, services, and it's a really exciting project. Uh, in terms of when that will be turned around to tutors, I think probably it's more likely that the Blackboard Analytics could be turned around this year rather than next year, well, but, I, so. <laughs> but I think probably realistically uh, next year, mid, maybe midway through next year, we should be able to, to offer that functionality, well, May, hopefully before. <laughs> when we were already starting to, you know, we are almost at the point where we are going to be given like the little test group of tools that we will actually call because they're, they're these super average students. So we called them and go, hey, we randomly call them students to see how you're going and, and then straight away offer them support and see how it works. Yeah, so, yeah, so... So the projects, yeah, I should have said that probably, uh, that um, while most of the development work on the kind of conceptual side and the architecture is going on in the TNL space, in the student support services, there's also some smaller projects going on around looking at the validity of the current interventions that we're using and looking at ways that we can provide da dashboards. Um, but I think the teaching analytics bit, I think, is further upstream in terms of where the risks are. And so, you know, there's a reason why we're doing what we're doing. But if we can uh, get buy-in from senior exec, we should be able to, to move quite quickly on, on that capability. That is the dream of this. Um, from the IT side of things, the, at the start of this year, uh, we introduced, or the system that uh, introduced a new feature, um, some student analytics capabilities that allow individual lecturers and unit controllers to see uh, all the stats for their students for viewing recordings, uh, lecture and track recordings, and those sort of things uh, in the IPTRA system showing percentage completed, um, whether they participated in any live webcasts and a few other things. So some of the systems have that sort of basic level, if you like, um, down at the unit level uh, for uh, analyzing. What's the, what's the cost-benefit equation having identified them early of um, uh, keeping, trying to retain them in the system versus actually encouraging them to, um, to exit the so, I mean, seriously, I mean, um, yeah, um, I think, yeah, that was it. Um, it's just incredible how much money we would actually save if we could retain even a small proportion of the, the students that are uh, leaving. Um, and I think that gives you some sort of idea 2.4 million to 50. Is, is that the funding model, or is that because, you know, I mean, clearly a lot of attention gets put into the to, to this small cohort that. Um, it is, remains at relatively high risk, and uh, you know. Mm. Yeah, it's making an assumption, I guess, that you can say mm. yeah. that there is actually a strategy that can be put in place mm. to reverse where we're fleeing. And there's a really powerful, um, so we were talking about it earlier, with Kurt was actually here earlier, believe, me, believe it or not, uh, but we were actually talking about that, how, how much easier in a way it is to argue for, for student retention rather than it is to argue for the research capability which actually, if you think about it in the longer term, it's probably going to open up more functionality and give us more in terms of return on investment. But, you know, you have to still make those arguments at the senior exec level and you have to still, you know, you need to go for those areas where you can make that financial argument and that's why student retention I think, <coughs> has been such a powerful area to, to really spearhead this study through. But we really feel that there's so much more <laughs> to this data set and it's just about for us closing that loop and making a dynamic in interaction. Um, so I think that there's a lot of complexity around those financial arguments anyway because they can be very simplistic um, but they can also be quite powerful and when you're asking for a couple of million or whatever to develop the capability you know you need to look at that return on investment argument so um, just kind of a comment and a question back to what you're saying about um, tutoring you know we have a lot of teachers haven't had analytics for a long time you kind of go by gut and kind of get this sense of Kind of know, and I'm just wondering whether or not there's been any feedback as to whether or not uh, academics are using these uh, information as a way to say, well, you didn't pass because you did this, and they're using it as a um, sort of stick in the porch. If you had done this, you would have passed. But when a student appeals a mark, for example, we, I tend to find that my colleagues then use those that data as the tool to say this is why. 
Um, I guess that was one comment. And then the second one was really about language and the fact that we're saying you know, that the more they interact with Blackboard, the better they perform. I suppose, and to me, Blackboard is just, it's just, the, you know, I don't understand um, what the activity is that they're doing. So, you know, I'd rather inform my students and say, it's not really about Blackboard, but if you actually do more of the online discussions or you actually are in with it. I think it's just a language thing to me. It's too ominous. Yeah. I don't know how we can address that in, in terms of what we're doing. But if it's coming down to measuring an activity or a learning outcome or proficiency in a skill, then we focus less on the tool and more on the yeah. on what they're doing. I think it's really a very important and really good point because you know data can be used for good, but it can be used for evil. <laughs> and I think it seems to me that I mean if you look at evaluate, that's a very good example where, you know, what was what was driving evaluate, which is our um, qualitative studies that we do with students, was really a good thing. And I think that in a way it has kind of become a bit of a stick to to, to bash the tutors with, and you know that was never its intention. So I think there's always going to be a danger, a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde kind of relationship between how data is used, and I think that that's just going to be a danger. I think we have to find ways to to use the data in a responsible fashion, you know, with, with ethics in mind, obviously, as well. And the, the issue of, of language around this is, is also quite being talked about a lot at the moment, particularly in areas like ethics, equity, and social justice, the use of, of the term at risk, for example, because because a student might fall into the at risk category, but they might not actually be doing any of the at risk behaviours that, that they matched up with, you know? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so it's, they might not be yeah, yeah, by choice. Exactly. <laughs> so you can't, yeah, there's going to be a lot more discussion then, I think, about how these students are managed. Because just because they're in one particular group, because that's what they've matched up with, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to actually have those behaviours. That's just false positive. Isn't it? Well, it's just, you think that they are at risk, they might not be. Whoops. You can work on your model to refine it, but if you, can, if, you were, if you can save 50 students and two and a half million dollars, but more importantly, the fact that 52 students will be able to finish their degree, yeah. then if you have to speak to 55. And well, five, exactly, yeah, 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 I mean, that's the point, is that it's good, but I'm talking about the language. Yeah. We don't want to be mean students to go, hey, you're a risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I assume Curtin has a team of people that deal, that deal with students that they think are struggling. And I think part of the tact is that you just don't Yes, exactly. That's the, but we then how do we... Well, well that's the problem. It's exactly a social justice might change. I think we're going we to go to Canada. Oh, that's the moment. Unless you... Yeah. you want, I, think, I think a better term is basically not at risk, but that they're not optimised. As an example, they might be doing the wrong course. You can say, all right, well, productively, <laughs> you are doing the wrong course because it really doesn't fit with, with your strengths or weaknesses. And you should probably suggest another course you can do. Uh, Sorry, I, I, I wouldn't do that. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm supposed to be presenting with Sarah. Because <laughs> <laughs> my diary said this starts at 3.30. I was five minutes early and half an hour late. Um, <laughs> so, Sarah, you're going to be presenting with us about the Blackboard Research Project. Yeah. Um, and you're going to talk about how Blackboard is used in the Australian Teaching Sector. Yeah. Can you just talk about that a bit? Yeah. Um, so, the Blackboard Research Project is a research project that was generated in the UK by the UK. It is actually the easy thing. And we talk about this concept of analytics 2.0 and analytics 3.0. And most of you guys, a few people nodding that have read the Harvard article by Tom Davenport, who's the god of analytics, and he wrote the book, Computing Analytics. And so getting the insight is easy. And you don't cross the creepy line when you know that someone's at risk. You cross the creepy line when you send their dad a pregnancy key, don't you? That's when it sort of goes wrong and it sort of aimed at your 16 year old daughter and you know the daughter's pregnant before he does, you know, it's kind of problematic. So where most businesses struggle today, Curtin is no exception, is if we're gonna go away from trends and measuring, you know, how good we are, you know, we wanna go from 88 to 87 percent to 90 percent, yeah, that's all good and well, but that's just a trend. It doesn't tell you what to do. If we now start saying that, you know, Kurt's more at risk than Sarah, we have to change the business operational model too. And most businesses struggle with that because they don't know how to deal with granular insight into their business. Uh, I do a lot of work in the safety space, and I can tell you which workers on the mine sites or oil and gas sites are going to get hurt next. And even beyond our care of duty to students, our care of duty to staff and contractors are so much higher. But safety in the same way only looks at trigger and LTFR stats. They have no idea what to go and act when I say, 
John's going to get hurt in the next three weeks on a Monday just after lunch. Yeah, but that's not an investigation or I'm not looking mm -hmm. at the stump stats. And I think coming back to your question is how does the university then change? And there's a lot of the cool work that Sarah and David is working on where the experience will be so seamless in a personalized learning experience that you won't even know that we're targeting you. And I think that's about the, at the sort of the cornerstone of the question you're asking. Okay, well, thank you very much for that discussion. So we're just going to go into panel mode now. So we'll have a chance to hear a bit more from Kurt. This really is that I can see the chair. Okay, so uh, can I start the speakers to bring their chairs to the front? I'm going to have a chair.
was not sophisticated enough because it wasn't really mapping that well against the reality of the social side, you know, the academic background, the, you know, the environment, the social interactions, the methods of learning, the tools of learning, and just the whole kind of gamut of things that made up that student's journey through their life as well as through their experience at Curtin. And I think having that kind of much more um, subtle understanding of that concept really helped me to understand the whole process of what we were trying to do and actually put a lot about learning analytics as well and what it, what it could be. And I think that is just making, as Kurt was saying earlier, a much more sophisticated and, and granular understanding of, of learning experiences. I've just had two students, um, two of my students, withdrawn. Um, and I contacted them and found out why. It was, had nothing to do with the fact that they were taking <coughs> below it. It was, but there was also all these other things happening in their lives. They wanted to succeed still, but they just had to withdraw at this time, and they may well come back. Um, so, you know, just because they withdraw doesn't mean they'll never come back. Um, so the amount of people, people need time to, sometimes it's good to fail, and then you, if you still got the dream, then you can get better second time or third time. So, you know, the numbers themselves are. So then that, that's something that will help us still because we, in our area, we're not about retaining the student, we're more about their experience. So if they need to leave, if there's something else that they're better off doing, then we can assist them to do that, help them with the paperwork, make it all a lot more seamless. So they leave less stressed and they don't yeah. just and not talk to anyone. So if, if we know they're at risk and they're going to go anyway, we can still talk to them and make that that transition easier. Yeah, and hence give them a better experience when yeah, they might want to come back. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's very good. I mean, you have to make that choice, three choices. Sorry. That what are we going to keep doing, stop doing, start doing? And in terms of, you know, most business in WA runs on the 80 20 rule, 60 40, because margins are so fat in WA, we make so much money, we just have to fall over something. In almost all businesses, it's, e it's relatively, by world scan, it's easy. That margins are being squeezed now. There's a few very good books and stories about chasing a long tail. You know, in that 20, there's a, there's a lot of things there. So whilst you may still have corner cases, you can get way down that tail of understanding other indicators. Because if all the things you described that student, of course, there's models that have a thousand twenty variables, and some of those things could become early indicators of behavior. So less attendance, less use of uh, digital things become then a monitoring control. I guess you don't know. The potential for misinterpretation is pretty high, given Gareth's diagnostic sort of analogies. So what's critical in the systems to be able to get more reliability and validity to what you're doing? I've uh, found big uh, uh, increased data sets, smart questions, um, and people looking at it from different angles. Um, drilling down into that long tail. So if you've got a diagnostic or a sieve or whatever, or an analytic, and it says this group is at risk, and, and then now you want to drill down into that tail and find out why. Um, and so you bring up the student, and you say, well, what's happening in your life? What is this about? And then you bring the information back into your, you know, back into your, back into your, to, to your model. It's kind of like a medicine. Um, you know, you have a certain set of way of getting to a point, <coughs> Sort of along, but at that point, you say, "Look, I've got to this point. You know, how am I interpreting that with you as a person?" And that's a, an in-depth mm -hmm. discussion. Um, so I think it's the same. It's the same. And I guess there's a second part to that, as Sarah was highlighting. Taking a dynamic analytic model means that every time you take an interpretation, it could well be different to the yeah. last one you've taken because you've fed something back in. So it, it gets even more complex. So this model, what's, like, why we like this, I mean, you, you won't plan all the interventions from it, but it's a great way to understand what's going on and get a feeling for what the might do is. If we, if we, and we've just done this, by the way, we've just taken all the sensors they and thrown them over here. Um, and the students that were in here, that, went, that didn't leave, at a rate of, was it 98%? Left. So it was a very high, accurate prediction, and then we got 2% wrong. Which I think, in terms of knowing, is, is, is quite powerful. But we've also seen, we haven't rebuilt the model, we just said, show us who are all the ones that didn't come back to census. We, if we did the refresh, we will see people moving from here, first year predominantly, would they move here 
or into this cluster, or do you move closer to the engineering bodies? And, and I think that's the ability to have a consistent landscape that allowed people to change behavior. Because if I have a home situation, my change behavior will demonstrate different outcomes. On the question of misinterpreting data, uh, absolutely a, a, a risk. In, I think there's three places where that gets done wrong a lot. Looking at one data set, I mean, lots of talk about my data set is bigger than yours, and it's not really what it's about. It's about how many things you can bring together, so the different perspectives. The other one is uh, different, uh, getting the data as close to the experts as possible. So you get the experts sitting in his head, so you can do both, but you also corroborate. I think the, the you know, physicians and the, and the specialists are actually very good at corroboration. I would say so, so some of the top lawyers and so forth. Uh, at Kirkland, what we did is to get to the front end is we actually made people part of the journey, sorry, explain, and then let them play the model themselves. Because you do two things. Once you validate the model, until you move people by their own experience, getting immersed in the data itself. And then the third big pitfall I see is, and this is a statistical challenge, and stats is really one of the areas that I think needs to pick up big time in big data, because they're going to lose out like the actuaries are losing out to die. Um, and that's scoping. We want the perfect data set. We struggle the outliers out when we do analysis because they really skew our models. And yeah, I see a few people shaking their head, but that's what happens. The best analytics I've seen are the ones who can really clean up the clean up the data set but not lose the data and then deal with missing data and deal with and produce data because that tells you something about the process. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, missing data. If someone doesn't ever swipe into the library, that tells you something. But we don't think like that. We just tend to see who's in the data set for library. So I, I just got a question. A lot of what everybody seems to be talking about is the actual creation of the model. Is there a common framework by which you actually start or create the model that you start wanting to interrogate? And how is it that you come up with that? I mean, what's the starting point? I mean, we always kind of know that we've got to, we've got to get the data. We could probably link the data. And we could start asking questions. I think the most complicated thing that I see about this process, whether it's genetics or whether it's learning analytics or whether it's, you know, um, you know uh, OHS, whatever it is, how do you actually just miraculously create models very quickly? And, and, and because it seems to me like analytics as a process is a very, very long and arduous process. We need to be able to be more dynamic to be able to create models more quickly uh, and have them validated. We tried to do that actually in the Sunday on the paper side. Just submitted actually to Asia, BJ, I think, which um, is the technology it was uh, called the Foundation of Analytics. And what we tried to do there is to extract, extract out some of the processes that we did in the study to try and create a kind of more generic, higher level model. Uh, I'm not saying it's, or framework. it's brilliant, or yeah, it's pretty much, um, it's not brilliant, it's not perfect, but at least it's a starting point to try and do that. And I think the idea was, you know, well, we've learned so much from the study. You know, we need to make it, you know, do it out there so people can actually start to build on that. So it's kind of where we're moving towards, but I wouldn't say that it was a perfect model. But, you know. Everyone wants to jump into the bandwagon, don't they? Oh, it's so sexy, you think that you know, you know, you can do the stuff people are wanting. The reality is that data scientists today are, are not too good at all. But <coughs> all of them are under employed. So most of the businesses that I work with, I see that they're very smart data scientists doing extension reporting that the business intelligence or data warehouse should be doing anyone. Mm -hmm. But what happens is they become a god because they give access to information that people shouldn't have in the first place. And we've hired this guy and he's actually worth the money to me because that information is worth it. But the data scientist hasn't based on. So we see this whole fragmented thing where people start building either Excel uh, spreadsheet empires or <laughs> what's the newest trend is access database empires and very soon everyone will have their own SQL database that they play with because of the Historic, it's changing now, but the historic divination between IT that says what you can and can't have, and people that want to do what they can and they can't. The answer to your question, though, is um, if you watch Moneyball, what is the problem? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's exactly the same. So it's all about aligning your tools and your technologies and your approaches to the problem at hand. And in my area, it's a clinical need, and it might be a diagnosis, I have a lot of return. And if you have that line of sight and that clear focus, then you can bolt on and bolt off these and then iterate through them as you go along. And you will identify the champions uh, that can help you to, to propagate that and, 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 to, and, and to solve it. One of the reasons for faces has been a good area of work, work in 
that's not just an interesting thing about um, But But there, there, there is, yeah, it's not creepy. Uh, there are so many areas where it's actually required in medicine, so um, for the bit for planning or for, or, for the, or for diagnostics or for doing other sorts of treatment monitoring, whatever the application, whatever the application is. And so you can you can get a uh, you can get a nexus of expertise saying, hey, we're that, we're that. You get some information, you can move forward, but it's always aligned to a problem. We need to make diagnosis. We need to predict how good our surgery is going to be. We need to reduce the number of surgeries by modeling how this is going to affect as this is going to change with our niche. So and and then and, and then what, what I've watched with the computer vision scientists and the computer engineers is watch them go from kind of not, certainly not passive, but to become very much involved in that. And it's very interesting to watch how their approach to things change. So suddenly they go goes from um, uh, the traditional kind of model, something that actually is really biological. Watching how these algorithms kind of evolve over time, it, it really, they really become very <coughs> biological in their in, in their in their in their own and we're going to go through that happens through that through that discussion. Mm. I agree that um, <coughs> it's good to have a problem. I think what I've learned from this study was actually the fact that you can have a much more qualitative, qualitatively driven approach to hypothesis formation and then use the, sure. the data sets to interrogate them. Yep. I think that bringing together between the qualitative and the qualitative, and it wasn't necessarily problem centered, but it was um, hypothesis centered. Was so, I think yeah. really a very big breakthrough for me because I've been working with big data for a long time and for me it was always, you know, so what it was kind of the feeling because you've got this data but, you know, what do you do with it? Yeah. Um, I think Jim made that point earlier where I think what, what this study taught me was that actually you can actually use focus technology really effectively. Um, so I'm not sure whether it's driven by problem or driven well, by... I think, I, think if you know, I, I think there's a need and then you can apply the different <coughs> things to, to, the, to the need. Um, and I guess you see a lot of that in in uh, with <coughs> genetic medicine and other sorts of medicine, where you can, there has been a, some move from okay, I've got a hypothesis or a problem, um, and I'll, uh, so we'll design an experiment to, to do that. To okay, now I can look at a whole range of things, and out of that, try and uh, generate hypotheses. Almost a like, hypothesis generating uh, 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 projects. Yeah, because the, the issue is that. We're never smart enough to ask the right question. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. No, it's not. And I was interested in your, there was the association between Blackboard use, which just seems some sort of uh, interfacing with students, and, um, and, 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 and retention. Do you have the ability within your set to look at what is about the students that use Blackboard better? It, what is it? Yeah. Is that what's made for the key question? So on the Blackboard data set, did we say, um, we never should put that yeah. um, so the big difference with this approach to the other one is we answered 51 hypotheses with one data set. So it's very hard to contradict yourself if the underlying data set answers 51 questions. And whilst you might have the answers right, you get you get 35. Can we run that up? Let's keep going. Okay, so that one showed, the previous one showed that low blackboard usage, which is blue, correlates with high attrition. And, and if, but if we go forward, I'll just get the other three out. Um, those ones is Gareth's point. These guys don't use Blackboard at all, and they don't leave. And if you understand how this model works, if I'm far away from you, then I'm very different to you. So we know that these guys behave very differently, mostly because these tend to be from Asian countries. The Chinese over here tend to be from Asian countries. And there are people that leave over here, but these don't leave. So I need to treat this group that doesn't use Blackboard and this group that doesn't use Blackboard very differently. And I think that's where the dynamic comes in. So we can go down to the deeper of what's their names, what the student number is, and then the ethics steps in. How do you then interfere? What's the right way to do it? Yeah, and that sort of stuff has been found by the universities too. I was going to raise that point. That you can aggregate data to say that, you know, blackboard use equates to marks, more blackboard use, higher marks. But when you... Um, so no, but when you drill down into that, you find that it, you know, it depends on various other factors, like you just said, that, that, and, and the unit design is part of that as well. Yeah, I was really looking at the interactivity, not necessarily whether they've specifically logged in, because um, you find that sometimes that they've, they've, they've got high attrition is because they've already left. <laughs> no, 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 actually. Look, so, yeah, so I can tell you how we dealt with that problem, because by not being here, it's very hard to use that for <laughs> So, so how do you how do you do it? It's all to do with 
And this is where I think lots of people like to go jump in the tool and do the analysis. But for this project, this was 15% of the time, the modeling, and 85% of the time was spent doing the data play. I mean, sorry, the, the hypothesis creating and conversion outside the analytics ethics, 85% was spent doing the, time, the data play. So what we did is we looked at your Blackboard do so either week by week or month by month relative to your cohort. So if you are in um, health sciences where you don't use Blackboard because you can't mass out someone in Blackboard, or not yet anyway. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so relative to your cohort, we will benchmark you, not relative to all of the students. And therefore we can deal with the problem that if you've left, then obviously we can start measuring. Yeah, that's, that's, cool. that's quite a relevant point because there are some courses that are fully online versus ones that are more vocation orientated. So we've got it two ways. We've got it by month. I think it was by month. We have week, month, semester, but you get the same idea. And so we said the first semester, the average semester, and the last semester. And then we've also said the relative to your cohort. And so some of you've got four variables that have exploded from one data. What about the ethics side of things? Do, do your students know that um, you're looking at all this data about them? Are they giving permission? It's kind of vicariously done by accepting the terms and conditions of the do, do you, do you, how do you feel about Amazon? Well, yeah, I'm reflecting some thoughts from some students at a previous session about things like this. That they had no idea that, that the university was able to see those things about them, and they were quite um, disgusted about the They thought the face good to go. Ronnie, you actually have a look at the very, very... I think probably need to go through the ethics a little bit and yes, the other difficulty, and so that you know there is confidence that data is being used. Yeah. But I think it's I think it's a, it's a, it's always a degree. You know, if if a student failed because they studied the wrong unit <coughs> and they knew that you knew that they were doing the wrong thing, you could help them. Yeah, that's the other, other side of the argument, is the, the, the caring professional, the ethical professional who says, I know this student's going to fail, I must tell them that they're not going to fail. So very few, very few individuals have, I've, in all the research we've done, we've been doing this for years, like working on who's going to get hurt on one side, you know, which customer is more likely to buy the next product. Very few people have ever been outraged because the analysis has been done. The outrage has always come because of the intervention chosen. And that's so you should know, and you must know. But how do you then choose to execute is is, is very important. And we ran in this workshop, by the way, with students as well. They were very keen, and I, with with reservations, but on balance, their findings were: I'd rather know that there was a better option for me in campus than not. Know. Well, it's like, it's like, sorry, it's like the, the argument about targeted data you know, I actually I'm quite, I'm quite. Um, happy to have adverts which are targeted to my needs and wants and desires and things that I've looked at, rather than a whole bunch of stuff which is just random and, and, and not really targeted to me. But I know other people get very twitchy about the idea that someone's looking at what, where I'm going on Google or what I'm looking at and then targeting advertising specifically at what, what I'm looking at. So it's, I don't know, it's, 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 there's several, several ways of looking at it. And we're going to do it to a, to a small extent with certain So there's a um, like a step-up student who gets given extra ASAP in order to help them with their course, we'll, we'll call them because we know because of who they are and what they're doing that they might be at risk. So but, kind of already doing it, but on a teeny tiny scale. Well, we are always doing it. Like, he's fun to be students. He targeted them. He's yeah. a little bit of his brain to target those two students. Right. I've <laughs> So, I've responded. I find the other ethical thing there to flip sides. What if you don't intervene? If you do have in, in, information and you, and you don't intervene, yeah. yeah. who gets the lucky draw as to you know, when you offer, you offer support? So, do you just care? Yeah. So, we're looking at that problem right now for good. We've certainly covered the project, but we're actually saying, and I won't mention that these initiatives that are running now, first of all, it's very hard because you do post hoc analysis. Okay? So, if you haven't left, you're successful. <laughs> But what if you were never at risk? So, you know, so the, the whole question then says, well, if you were stayed and you were not at risk, then you need to look at the cohort immediately that looks like you that did not take up that. 
be able to break that retention service. That's the only way to measure how stock. And you need to do the granularity level of individual students. Um, and that's how you calibrate where you spend because, I mean, you, you guys know much of the retention in, in this place. We've got teams here, we've got hundreds of different programs. Some of them are brand building, but most of them get the funding based on their retention. So what we're now doing is going to come up with some truths about, well, where is retention working and not working, and where we're spending our resources effectively. It will always be about where's the most benefit. And one of the areas I think Curtin will target next, but we probably shouldn't, on the thesis agenda, is we're losing more high quality students than we'd like to. I think one of the things with analytics, though, is an observation a lot of people make. It's being done to them rather than with them. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at the moment, a lot of students don't know this is being done, but they'd probably buy in if they actually knew where they could actually benefit from it. But I think, that, I mean, this is a research project, so obviously we're governed by ethics procedures and processes and so on. Uh, but I think, so really the, the problem doesn't come now, it comes when it does actually move into the kind of student support services or when it actually does become the dashboard for the tutors. And when that information does become, that circle does become closed off, I think that's when, you know, really the ethics issues will really start to come in. I think the data protection, privacy legislation and so on, you know, these are real massive challenges, I think, not just for this project, but for many projects. So I do think ultimately the benefits, you know, to see, I mean, it does seem that the, the argument is more about why you know it kind of is beholden to us to ensure that the students' experience is enriched, that, that they do have the best capabilities that we can possibly give them, the technologies we have. So I think probably the weight of the argument moves that way. And I mean, the issue with ethics is you know <coughs> these are complicated things and they aren't necessarily as, as uh, Gary from you know there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer uh, always. Uh, but if there's a possibility that you can support that student experience and you can make that experience better. I think there is a kind of onus on, on mm -hmm. person to, to really explore that. Not to mention, it is personalised access to that data themselves. Mm -hmm. It's letting the students see their own, yep. their own data. And uh, you, you know, that's the most rewarding experience I've ever had, because I, I get caught up in this discussion in the ivory towers and prisons and uh, in the head offices and talking about employees on the mine site. So number one, talking about mines and you know, body gas guys is keep your employees safe. And exactly the same thing, because you profile behaviour. And, and we're also having this discussion. Meantime, we said there's three people who are going to get hurt in the next three weeks, and then they do it. But when we went to site and we put up this model, people were fascinated. We had to preempt it, we had to check very right, carefully, moving format. But we've got a select group of people, and they all gave permission. Because this is anonymized, by the way. Curtin's got this data set, they don't know who the students are. So there's no specific risk right now of taking the wrong action. They know that you, which school you go to or which year you are, but they don't know the, the number. That number is hidden until there's a reason to release the number. So we can't bring it back. It's been cut off for, for all that reason. So we then put it up and we then got their permission to show it out. And, and I think half of them gave permission. A quarter of the way through the project, they asked for all of the names within the room to be added because they all wanted to know where they are relative to the risk groups. And the, you were exactly right. When you engage, um, that the, the customer or the student or the person you know, becomes very powerful. At the scale that you've got here, I think you need to find a way to manage it effectively. But I mean, in the right that you, the curtains going on and this personalized learning experience is really adaptive, um, you know, in terms of what you learn and how you get assessed, you will get this feedback to your team line. So you will see where you are in terms of where your, where your mates are, you know, how much of the course they've completed, which choices they've made, the next best offer in terms of how you study your next unit component or task or challenge will really open up that playback. And it's the same challenge for surveys. I'm, I refuse to fill in a survey if you don't give me something back these days. And the way to give something back is we fill in the survey, here's where you are to everyone else. And that's the only way where, where surveys are actually still successful. Any other comments from people here? Oh, sorry, I said I did want a question about the the questions that you were looking at and that you started looking at. 256 hypothesis, 51 answers. Answer. Okay, do it. Of those, is there a theme emerging in terms of what does affect retention? Is it about, for example, facilities, or is it about that personal engagement with somewhere on university? Is it about accessibility or flexibility? Can you see any things? Because if that personal experience is what we're looking for, and that personal engagement with the data is important, is that underlying as well in your experience that question? So the, the whole, and the 
a great question because I think that's where we go with it. We've been told in management to go, tell me the three things I need to know, and then I go action and execute them because that's, you know, that's how we run. What are the three things? And we're actually, with this process, trying to start against it because there are no single answers. But we've gone to great pains to say blackboard usage generally increases retention. And as we've said, near the places we invented it. Fatigue on sites do lead to injuries, but not here. And I think um, there's a great book called, you know, uh, and the ambiguity advantage, which talks about leadership today, um, which, especially for you know, the CXO level of businesses, you know, in Kurt and Abigail uh, and and so forth, which is how do you make decisions in, the, in this ambiguity of no longer being able to do black and white? <coughs> Kurt does something really amazing when you get students in at the cutoff point of, of the APAR. You uplift them better than most universities. You've got guys below cutoff that got for some reason into Curtin that perform in the top quartile of all students in Curtin. That's an amazing success story. And that's because you treat those students in a different way. And I think if we if we try and answer the question you just asked, we'll be unfair to what it's going to be Sorry, what was the name of the book? Um, the Ambiguity Advantage. Yeah, we're closing off there, maybe we'll get the last question and then over to the New York City. Just as we're going through the slides, I saw that we actually covered on what's the story with the chicken and the rope? Yeah. <laughs> so, who's driven into Curtin? Yeah. Oh, is that what I was saying? That's exactly what I was saying. That's the idea that came out of finance, not out of market. We still don't know where it came from. Yeah, Ian Callahan. Ian Callahan. Ian Callahan told us to do it. I thought it was the guild. No, no, it's Ian. <laughs> okay, so uh, everybody's invited now to come to drink while you're in the building one and five under the library. So we have to get everybody.